I want to tell you a couple things about how me and Tony got into Mr. Don West over here. Okay. Every day at Shop at Home Collectibles, you know, my man Tony saw you, you know, selling cards and everything else you were selling and, you know, introduced me to your show. I'm like, I know that guy. And we would watch this thing constantly, all right, like all the time. And if we couldn't watch it together, we would – actually record it and are you talking the baseball card other. show yeah yep. yeah yeah when you were doing the psa 10s and the rookies so we'd actually wait to uh have the opportunity to watch it together because it meant so much to us it was so much fun because your enthusiasm as a salesman is second to none your passion for sports and we're going to go there in a moment you know i'll be honest with you people know me more from that even than because the wrestling's its own little click yep the wrestling fan is a re – there's nothing better than a wrestling fan, but they're their own little clique. Uh, I still, to this day, uh, people with the – they might even hear my voice in a grocery store or something. They're like, man, you sound like the guy that used to sell baseball cards. That show was huge. People don't know how big that show was. I can't we were doing about $150 million a year in sports cards for there, – there, there's a true – I mean, I, at one point I'd sold over a billion dollars in baseball and, and, well, Michael Jordan basketball cards too because that was the big yeah. thing. But at one point, it was that – it was unbelievable. Uh, late at night. late Because at that time, you didn't have 100,000 channels. So you had maybe four or five infomercials, HBO and me. And uh, I was the highest rated show at 3 in the morning sometimes. It was wild. <laughs> I believe it. It was unbelievable. We, we had some tremendous nights. And to have you be dialing me right now to hey, talk the about phones are locked up. They're in queue. If you're having trouble getting through, people, be patient. You got to understand, but you got to keep trying because we're running out of these things. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, your delivery you just knocked over stuff on my desk. Your delivery is so much fire and passion and intensity to it. So I, I want to ask you about, you know, what was like your, your influence in sales and like your delivery? Where did you get? Because it's unique. Your phrasing is excellent. All that. How did all right. You ready for this? Where I did, perfected my sales skill, I'm not making this up. I used to I, I, I used to manage a Kenny shoe store in the mall. Now, do you all remember Kenny shoes I do. back in the old mall days? They had Kenny, they had Stride Right, and, and Tom McCann. Yes, yes. Every mall had a Kenny shoes, and it had everything. It was the family shoe store, so it dress casual kids parents adults uh, you know it was all age and um i literally got into the kenny shoe management program and ended up running a couple different kenny shoes uh, uh one in decatur alabama and one in morristown tennessee and not knoxville tennessee and and but i used to to do this thing and it, where, where i really started getting goofy was like young boys would come in and mom and they want they want a name brand shoe you know they kitty shoes doesn't work for a 14 year old kid but mom's got six kids and she's not gonna go buy them uh go down to Foot Locker, which kitty shoes own believe it or not uh, -huh. uh but go down to Foot Locker and get him a nike we're gonna get whatever but i so i used to start this spiel and i would bring out this fake invoice this fake form and I would come out to the boy after he's tried the shoes on and he's just, you know, he wants to go somewhere else. And mom's like, uh-uh, we got the right price here. We're going to do it. And I'd say, okay, I need you to sign this, though, before I can sell this to you. And, and the kid be like, I'm not, what, what, are, what are you talking about? And the mom's like, what do you, what do you mean I got to sign it? And I said, well, here at Kenny's Shoes, we can't guarantee his personal safety from all the females at school once he wears this in, in public. I mean, these kids have been known to be jumped, mugged. I mean, I've, I've known kids that have come home with 19 different brands of lipstick and had parents call me and want to know what's going on, and I won't have that. So if this kid wears those shoes and every girl in the in the in the in school wants to attack him, you're not blaming me. You're not coming in here. And I would start this spiel. And of course, it worked every time. Kids were, you know, they were going out without them shoes. And I started it there because you'd work 12, 13 hours a day in these malls, man. I mean, 70, 80 yeah. hours a week. It was, and you had to, if you were going to be, do it right and do it well, you had to be different and good at it. And, and that's where the whole shtick started about, you know, kind of in your face, man, are you kidding? What I'm going to get you right now? Do you know what these shoes are? Do you know who wears these shoes? <laughs> Elvis Presley wears these, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, so Kenny's oh, shoe store. Amazing. I could listen to you do it all day, bro. 
Do you know who Vince Russo is? I do. Okay, Tony. Also, I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a big wrestling fan. And okay, be fair, does he not I, got the Vince Russo bro down? He does. Hey, bro. Hey, you, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, John. Go ahead. Go ahead, buddy. Oh, I, you're great, but it's like at 3 a.m. Like you're sitting there on your couch, like you were talking about late at night, and you want to make a purchase. I'm like, man, I think I need this. He's telling me I need it. You have to be dialing now, you know. And I, I just the, the quickness of your pitch. It, it was always so much fun. And like I said, me and my buddy would watch this all the time and record it and rewatch some segments. And it really made me want to buy baseball cards, knives, coins, whatever you were selling. Funny. I started funny. in knives. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Funny story, though. I'm a big baseball card collector, too, right? I started yeah. maybe 1987. And I'd watch the show, right? 69 like, for me, but yeah. Oh, wow. Nolan Ryan. Yeah, it was uh, 68. 68 is <laughs> Nolan Ryan, rookie. Yes. And I'm like... Oh my God. I, I knew some of these things were like, oh man, this is a lot of stuff that I don't really want or need. And but I still almost called and bought stuff all the time. I'm like, well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, true story. My wife and I were telling this the other day at work. True story. We're on vacation. Uh, now the show's being done in Nashville, I think, at the time. Mo at Knoxville for most of my time. It was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And then my last few years, it moved to Nashville. 98 to 2001 and Terry and I took a vacation out to Napa Valley and we're we're in Napa Valley and Calistoga this city and we and it's my wife's birthday and the and the place that we're staying the owner he got to got to know us and liked us and he said hey normally there's a six month waiting list but I'm going to get see if I can get you guys in this restaurant it's called the Auberge de Soleil it's just a real fancy restaurant in Napa or in, in the Napa Valley and uh so, you know, there's no prices on the menu kind of thing. It's really neat. So we get there and we have our meal and we're having a good time and we're on vacation. And there's this beautiful woman sitting a few tables over and she keeps staring at me. And uh, I keep, I'm, I'm teasing Terry, my wife, and I'm like, Terry, look, that girl's looking at me, man. And she's staring at me and she wants an autograph. And Terry's just laughing, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but then finally Terry's like, she is staring at you. So this is going on and on and I'm, I'm getting the big head, you know? So about, about time we're finishing up, I think. And, and I think we're getting ready to leave or something. We're waiting for a car and she starts coming over towards us. And she's coming right at me. And I said, Terry, Hey, this, this she's actually coming over. Do you, do you have a, a pen or a Sharpie or something? You know, I'm sure. And I'll never forget it. So she comes up and, and uh, she walks up, she says, uh, hi, are you Don West? And I went, well, yes, I am. You know, <laughs> well, of course I am. Why wouldn't I be? And I guess you say uh, you, there's no problem with uh, words on this podcast, John? No, no, no. no. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, it's the only time I'll do it. But she looks at me and says, well, let me tell you something, you motherfucker. She says, you have cost me my marriage. You, because of you, my husband has spent over $60,000 in sports cards. We're getting divorced. We got no money. He's bought a bunch of garbage. He's got all this boxes of stuff. And I mean, it's, and you talked him into it. And you, and you are the devil. You're Satan. You're a piece of shit. And I mean, just laying it on me, man. And I'm sitting there not knowing what to do. And the restaurant's trying to come over. And I'm like, hurry, get the car. Now, if I'd have been smart, I looked at her and said, so do you want an autograph or not? But I, I didn't have... <laughs> I just didn't have the. I mean, you, when you get screamed at like that, that would have been cojones. Teams, you don't know what to do, and I'll never forget that she's like, "My husband has spent over sixty thousand dollars on boxes of cards. They're probably worthless." And I mean, it was just you run my marriage, you son of a bitch. True story. That's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. You know. Uh, I, I could see how someone could do it. I mean, if you had the means and the funds, there was times where I had to like Tony and my, you know, many others, millions, like you said, were watching this thing and you became like a, you know, a pop culture sensation. It like, did. Were, yeah. People were always imitating Don West and it, it, it was just a, one of those things that was just, it lit, it caught fire and it went viral. And you went viral before viral was even viral. It, it did. You're exactly right. It <laughs> went, I mean, magazine articles. I've been in a hundred Beckett magazines. I've been, yeah. uh, Tough stuff, Beckett. Uh, 
Oh, and 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 ball card owners that I go to these big conventions and and the little guys will be so mad at me. It's like I can't believe you're selling it for a hundred. I'm selling it for seventy. I'm like, well, you're missing the big picture. Then <laughs> tell everybody, as seen on TV, hundred dollars. I got it for seventy. You said you're not. You, you know, if you don't think I'm doing you a favor, you're missing out here. But and plus, I'm getting people interested to come in your store now. But it was crazy. It went once the cable. See, when we first started, I don't know if you guys know this. When we first started doing that show, this was 1991. Uh, I guess is when I first started doing the, 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 well, knives first and then the baseball card show, which is where I went. It was only people with set the giant satellite dishes in their yard. You had to have a giant dish and you had to aim it to Galaxy 7 or Stat 4 or whatever those satir- satellites were. And you had to, you had to move that thing. And we were doing maybe two million a year in sales max, maybe a million back early days. And then the cable changed. And once the cable changed, we started like we'd go on the History Channel, we'd buy out from two a.m. to five a.m. Mm-hmm. and we'd go to other stations. And once we started doing that, uh, about nineteen ninety five, the whole thing blew up. And at three o'clock in the morning, we're at 80 million homes. And like I said, unless you're watching a vacuum cleaner infomercial, the guy with the pile of baseball cards laying on it on the floor was going to win every time. And this show went viral. And we went in two years, we went from three million a year to 150 million a year in sales. Now, looking back, I wish that I had a different contract, but uh, (laughs) is what it is, you know. But so. Funny story, like you mentioned that, right? And I, I saw a tidbit once, or an, I think it was maybe it was um, it wasn't it was Bruce Pritchard. It was like yeah. a podcast or something, and he mentioned that you would outsell the gate in oh. March at TNA. We were, in fact, no joke. We were drawing such bad crowds because they didn't know how to market. Right. We might have five hundred people to a thousand people at a house show. And we would, I would, we started, we come up with all these gimmicks. I mean, I would take the, the, we started off where I would play like the wrestlers weren't there, but here's when they get here, here's what we're going to do. And I'd, I'd sell the programs first and a program had all the pictures. Now I said, once you got the program, they're only going to sign TNA stuff. So you want to get the program. So two, and we'd have this VIP early signing. So all 200 people buy the program. Then you bring them inside. Oh, they're running late. I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you guys get to the merchandise stand before anyone else, right? And I had the brown bag special, four DVDs, a T-shirt, a uh, Jeff Hardy necklace, and a Hulk Hogan headband or whatever we were doing. So everybody pays 20 for that. And everybody pays. And you sell some big items like belts and guitars. So we're just raking them in the money. Then we bring the the wrestlers out and they start signing everything and that's great. And then I would start doing the fun gimmick things like I'd have Jeff Hardy behind the curtain. And, and if you bought a Jeff Hardy action figure and anything else, Jeff Hardy, he would sign it in the back. So we'd line them all up. Well, every kid's buying wants to go yeah. meet Jeff Hardy. So they're lining up. And if you want to meet AJ Styles, uh, buy the AJ Styles action figure. He'll sign it in the back. And then I'd set up Velvet Sky, uh, who was so beautiful. We'd put her in the front and say, hey, if you want to get a picture taken with her, it's 10 bucks. And if you buy this $10 Velvet Sky banner, she'll sign it for you. So I'm getting 20 bucks. We were doing, on average, 30 to 40 bucks a head at the end. Wow. Which is unheard of. I remember Eric Bischoff saying, oh, I don't believe that for a minute. And then he went out and saw the routine. And Bruce Pitcher, it drove him crazy because he was used to the WWE where you didn't have to do that. You know, yeah. you don't got to go hawk anything. Well, he said it on Conrad's show, uh, something to wrestle with is probably what you're talking about. He said it. He said, I'm telling you, Don West paid, the, the, the merch sales paid for us for three, four years on the road. It was the merch sales because they weren't drawing big enough houses to make any money. But we would clean up 35 bucks a head on a thousand. That's 35 grand on a thousand people. And that covered everybody's airfare, covered everybody's talent fee. And then some. So, you know, it was wild, man. But we put up, I mean, we made, we invented gimmicks. We just invented yeah. different ways. We'd sell a backstage pass that was just a piece of, <laughs> of plastic or, you know, the, the peel off that you put on your chest. That's all it was. Cost us, you know, a hundred for a dollar. And we would take those and sell them for 50 bucks. And you get to go backstage, you know, during <laughs> the intermission and, and get some autographs. So, I mean, That's it, great, was, man. It, it was, it was, no, Bruce was right. Incredible. Bruce is a good dude. 
absolutely incredible. It's like being creative, innovative. That's what, you know, especially nowadays, Don, that's what life's all about. So we got to hit the reset button. But at the time you were doing it, people weren't thinking like that. Like that's progressive thinking, like in order to spend minimal amount of money to make maximum amount of money and make people feel like they need something and have personality and engage. I mean, for me, I've been a business owner a long time, teaching music. That's a big you know, aspect of what I do for a living is selling it to them, giving them energy, passion, all that kind of stuff. Aren't you a drummer? Aren't you a drummer, John? Yes, I am. I've been a drummer yeah. a long time. I know you like music. I uh, love tell, it. Uh, tell me about some of your favorite bands. Well, I'm a 70s rocker. You know, it's, it's you know, I'm, uh, uh, I mean, I gosh, I remember, speaking of drummers, man, I, one of my favorites is, Gilmore of Triumph and Rick Emmett of Triumph in those days, of course, Rush and Zeppelin and and um, we're big Super Tramp fans and yeah, I mean I can go on and on. I, I just love good old you know classic rock. I can and then of course uh, you know always love good guitar playing and but my wife and I we, we're rockers. But then again, we've discovered uh, the last two years Joe Bonamassa and we've 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 gone and seen him you know rock some blues and uh, all over the country. So uh, which is one of the best guitar players I've ever seen. But um, I mean everybody from Santana to I've probably been to a hundred concerts or more. I don't know. I mean it's I just I love good ro good rock music, man. Good rock the blues music. Blues is, is great too. Like you mentioned, that's like. You know, that's where the feel comes from. That's the origins, in my opinion. I mean, jazz was the birth pretty much to everything. But when you think about it, blues has roots that goes back a long, long time. And when it well, got it's about feelings. It, exactly. And it's it's that's what I love about it. And my wife is uh, a big country rock fan, which has blues elements. I was never into country. Me but Don, let me tell you something about country music. It's all about getting laid, paying your bills, you know. Um, knocking out your rent, being blue collared, and getting your job done, and then driving a the truck. Got to drink a beer drunk. too, and getting drunk. <laughs> yeah. Now my beer. wife, it's funny we were uh, we were actually talking about today at work. My wife's actually in a uh, a, a, a Blake Shelton video. His uh, you know. yes, his some beach video. They filmed it at my wife's bar, and uh, there's a couple times in the back of the video you can see my wife Terry walking behind. Now she doesn't have a speaking part or anything, but you can see her. She got the short. Blonde hair, spiked haircut. You can't miss her. And you'll yes, see her walking behind him uh, in the video. But Blake Blake filmed it in, in my wife's bar, in the Sun the Sum Beach video, which was actually the 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 song that, that started Blake's career, turned it into a mega hit, you know. But that was filmed uh, right there in Nashville at my wife Terry's bar. She had a bar? Yeah, well, I was I mean, she ran it. I mean oh, it wasn't cool. ours, but yeah, yeah. uh yeah, she ran it, man. She basically what a great, what a great town, man. Oh, it's good town. It's good town. Good town. Oh, In fact, we left there. We lived there yeah. 14 years and and I was just on the road so much with the wrestling. I was on the road for the last four or five years, almost 300 days a year. And and uh we're we're, we're, we're my wife and I are really close. We're buddies, and it, it just uh we wanted to make a move, and she followed me out here to Wana or a, a little town called Kashmir, Washington. So if you took the state of Washington, upstate Washington, and put a dart right in the dead center, that's Kashmir, Washington. That's where wow. we live, right on the Wenatchee River. And she came, and you couldn't – I don't think you could move her out with a crane, believe it or not. She only weighs 105 pounds, so that's that's hilarious. She so went from Chicago to Nashville to the middle of Washington. Indianapolis – we lived in Indianapolis uh, for a while, then Knoxville, then Nashville, and now uh, when or well, it's right by Wenatchee, but a little town called Cashmere, Washington. Beautiful, beautiful. That's cool. So, you, do you still follow college sports and pro sports? Oh, I do. Like I say, I do a sports talk radio show, and we and where we're at, it's it's a big agriculture area and and mountains and things, and we do about two hundred and fifty miles uh, square uh, radius. And it's uh, it's the number one uh, uh, sports talk show in, in the region, and we you know we got Huskies and Cougars and Pac-12, and of course this year it's been a it's been rough, a bummer, right? But, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, I I love college sports, co cover cover everything, and baseball is my thing. I'm still, but uh, baseball, football, Seahawks is huge here, huge, 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 yeah, and uh, Mariners and and in college football, basketball, and Gonzaga. I'm I'm only a couple hours from Gonzaga. Okay. And that's they're, huge here. They're number one this year. They number were. one, dude. That's a great story. 
That whole that's I remember unbelievable. When they were the From, Cinderella team. When we every were, year they were the Cinderella, and now they're they're a top five program. I mean, they, they are literally a top five Kentucky Duke Gonzaga program. They recruit like everybody else now though it's unbelievable they recruit a lot of foreigners they get right. a lot of players from europe and Japan. the eastern europeans yes and yes it's become a, a great job. hub for those guys to come over ohio state's got I'm, I'm, I'm a buckeye so they've ohio state well i went, to, well, I went to purdue oh <laughs> a real <laughs> school but that's okay <laughs> what you guys did to us though that was i gotta say that was the only time i was happy about us losing a game. That whole story behind that 2018 Purdue beat. Oh, down. and the kid. Oh, it was unbelievable. And you know the Poor. sad thing was we lost like four games straight after that. We beat yep. you guys like a redheaded stepchild, oh. and then we couldn't beat Northwestern. I mean, it was right. not. it was like a it was like an act of God, I swear. It yeah. was like the, the players were possessed. They oh. beat they beat oh, maybe the best team in the country, and I'm watching it shell shocked. I'm like, oh my God. We, yeah, I thought this new coach was going to do the thing, but uh, well, we don't know. This year, this year, you can't. Nah. Anyway, I, I want to ask you about sports, Don, and I think it's yeah. amazing that first of all, your show that you mentioned, I wanted to bring that up. You do three hours. I do every day, say? two to five on. Uh, it's a fi- uh, five sixty KPQ. If anybody ever wants to, you know, you can go to the KPQ dot com website, uh, or you can, you know, Intune Radio or whatever people can get these things at five sixty FM. Or a, excuse me, AM 560 AM uh, got a big signal and um, uh, every day two to five. That's what I just got home from uh, today. So, uh, in fact, I was dealing with a, with a guy who was upset that I I called him the Washington Redskins and because uh, I have oh. a text line and phone line and and people call in and they want to argue back and forth and uh, I made somebody mad today that uh, I'm all against this cancel culture bullshit. Yeah, I, I personally I am too. I mean, I, I saw today the the Cleveland. Indians oh. are going to change. Well, that's where it started, yeah. Atlanta Braves and Chiefs. Else. Yeah, everybody. Kansas City Chiefs. I said, you know who should be mad? It's not It's not people mad because the name's Cleveland Indians. I said the Indians should be mad that they've had Cleveland representing them for 105 years. <laughs> that's, that's the Indians, that's point. where we rooked them. We didn't burn them. By, but saying the Cleveland Indians honors the name. Who doesn't yeah. like to be an Indian? Um, Tony, are you an Indian too. fan? We're, we're Yankee guys. We're, yeah. John's from Jersey, too. I could right. tell by the bro. I figured yeah. he was Jersey. <laughs> the Vince Russo <laughs> gave it away. Vince Russo, bro. How's it going, bro, over here now? Oh, bro, bro. He'd say, bro. Hey, bro, 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 bro. So, Drive me John, crazy. So I just got – John just started watching wrestling maybe, what, two years ago? Yeah, I was a fan when I was a kid. Don, my favorite sports are baseball and boxing. I love MMA, uh, mm-hmm. combat sports, stuff like that. And I – what was it about three years ago on Christmas? I just caught up with Raw, and I'm like, This is so bad, it's great, and it was juicy. And then, my and we went to events. I watched the event live, uh, a SmackDown event front row, which was unbelievable. These guys are amazing. Oh, Raw. dude, in fact, you're getting to watch one of the best ever, uh, AJ Styles, who is. AJ Styles, who's, you know, maybe their biggest star, really, uh, right now. I called just about every match he ever did for 10 years. I yeah. mean, it, it, it thing- uh, seen him, you know, he's my boy. In fact, I'm the one, believe it or not, I named the Pele. Me and no. Mike Janae, my partner, we named the Pele. And 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 the upside-down bicycle kick, and AJ came by, and he's like, why do you call it the Pele? And we're like, you understand <laughs> the upside-down. And uh, we used to, he used to move over the rope, top rope. He'd do the Fosbury flop, Mike Janae. Maybe the Fosbury flop. We had to explain to him about Dick Fosbury from the 68 Olympics. And <laughs> AJ's the greatest. One of the nicest people, real person, real good husband, father. Um, what gosh, talent you I, guys I worked have. with AJ. I was with AJ 300 days a year, man, almost. You So you guys had a ton of talent at TNA. Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Bobby Roode. Not, not to mention the, the people that crossed over from Mick Foley to Kurt Angle to – to uh, uh, Nash and Hogan and Flair, and we've had everybody. Jeff Hardy, the the Dudleys, you know, we've had them all. I think Bobby Roode has probably one of the greatest introductions of all time. With the, maybe the best, the glorious, other yeah. than Undertaker, he, maybe he, the best. Right? Oh yeah, the Undertaker. That, that's really that's intense. But when Bobby comes, you know, yeah, he's Roode has got that swag, you know, and that song and the robe and everything. Like when I saw this, I'm like, look at this. I'm like, what have I been doing? 
all this time not watching wrestling because it's so good. And the storylines are amazing. Yeah, well, it's that's what I learned. I wasn't the biggest wrestling fan when I started. I uh, um, they used to watch my ball card show at three o'clock in the morning when they'd arrive at a hotel and they'd turn on the TV and that's the only thing on. And Jeff Jarrett and and Vince Russo and those guys would watch it and say, "All right, we got to get this guy in wrestling." And they actually tried to get me to leave Shop at Home uh, in 2000. I'm glad I didn't because WCW to go to work at WCW it folded about six months later, so that worked out. And Shop at Home wouldn't let me go. And then when I left Shop at Home, it turns out Jeff Jarrett lived right down the road from me. And uh, so I met Double J, and we went to dinner, and me, him, and his father, and one of the Harris twins, and. Ron Harris, and we just became friends instantly. And and but I didn't know a lot of this stuff. And I'll never forget. I, I was lucky. My broadcast partner Mike Tanay is such a cool sports fanatic, and we became friends instantly. He's a big gambler. He lives in Summerlin. He lives oh, in wow, Summerlin. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm twenty. And uh, he's a big Vegas. Uh, he lives real close to that uh, big casino out there. The uh, Red yes, Red Rocks. Red Rocks. Yeah. Red Rocks. Oh, what a yeah. nice place. Oh, I love that. The rooms are great. The machines are terrible, though. Oh, well, the, 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 it's a neat, neat place if you don't want to be on the strip, that's for sure. Yeah, but it is. It's but uh, he, I'll never forget the first day in the wrestling business. We're going down to our first show, Huntsville, Alabama. We're driving from Nashville. And Mike today looks at me and says, Don, I'm going to tell you, if you make it in this business, and you probably won't, never <laughs> thought I would, but we were. he says, you probably won't. But if you make it in this business – you are going to see things that you can't even describe to people. You're going to meet people that are unlike any other body, anybody you've ever met in your life. You're going to you're going to see a different type of character. You're you're going to see things. You're going to be places. And when you try to explain to people what you saw, they will not believe you. But it, it'll it, it it's the most unique living you will ever live. And I'll never I'll never forget that. And and of course he never thought I you know I was gonna make it a year and we didn't know if TNA was gonna make it the first year. Yeah. And then of course we worked uh 12, 12 years together. But I never he was so right. I mean it got to the point where you know uh you're you're in you're in the studio and and Jake Roberts has lost one of his snakes, you know, and, and it's you know running around and you don't even worry about it. Okay, whatever. <laughs> You know, it's just Jake uh, or, you know, uh, I, I can't explain some of the I, I, people don't believe me. And uh, it made normal life weird because you'd come home and then you try to have normal conversations. And and it was it, it just you, you, you can't. And then, it, and then it got to a point where it's too much. And it's just like, OK, I'm on the road too much. Normal is no longer normal. And I want to be a homebody. And, and finally, that's what we did. You know, it's and I got in the hockey business. As a yeah. musician, it's hard to come off of that. And when you get all these elations and high sensations that are out there, and then you come home and you just want normalcy, but then you you comprehend and digest everything. Like, and it's it's just a wild ride, man. Like when when you're around, I, I couldn't even. It's the music it. business, you know, John. It's oh, being on I've the road doing stuff. music. It's the same freaking thing. Don, I've seen some of the nastiest people on this earth. Greasy. Sloppy people get some of the hottest women you'll ever see. Oh, because they were good at music, and I'm like, what are they doing? I had a singer, and I'm sorry if, if this guy's listening. You know, I love you to death, but he was sloppy, okay, and sweaty. And I'm like, how how is he pulling all these girls? I'm gonna tell you why, but Don. He could do Journey. He could do Toto. He could <laughs> do Michael Jackson. He could do Tupac. Hey, hold the line, Toto. Hold not line. Africa, Toto. That's my boy, Bobby Kimball, man. I did a song with Bobby, um, and he's a great guy. Actually, I got a funny story real quick. He was in Vegas, and he was playing blackjack, and he forgot to cash in his chips for, you know, reasons that are obvious. And so bottom line is, you know, my man Bobby, I had to send him his earnings and collections. You know, like, he's like, dude, uh, would you mind if, if I send you the chips? and you? Because it was a substantial, you know, it was good. It was a good amount. And he's like, you could take a certain cut. I'm like, I'm not doing that, Bobby. You're my buddy, man. Like, I ain't taking, I'm not, I'm not putting points on this. Like, come on, bro. <laughs> like, it's like, what are we doing here? But Don, I got a couple more for you, brother. Uh, your love affair. Well, you know, sports. you know, real quick, real quick, John. And then yeah, you mentioned about people and you've seen the greasiest. When uh Tony, when 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 I was selling the wrestling stuff and we and we changed how we did a live wrestling show to sell merchandise. And we realized how much money 
I learned the biggest rule of life. Never judge a book by its cover because these wrestling fans, some of them, nicest people in the world. And and you would see people, and if you tried to judge somebody, you would think they didn't have $5 in their pocket. And these guys would pull out 50s and 100s, and I'll take that $400 belt, and I'll take that Jeff Hardy this, and let me have that that NWO thing. And and I learned, man, you can't – don't judge people, man. They're all – Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, What my dad is a lifelong Electrolux guy. Yes. Uh, uh, Vacuum cleaner. Yes, sir. All right. So when I was younger – we got, I got into doing, you know, door to door in home demonstrations and things like that. And you're right, man. It's the people who you think, oh, no way you're going to spend a thousand dollars on a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> they buy two and then they recommend one for their aunt. <laughs> and you told them this. You told them the same thing I did at Kitty Shoes. That Electrolux is better than the Kirby. That's it's right. better than the Kirby. <laughs> That's exactly 100%. Right. That's, that's the way to do it, you know, is put it in people's head and be creative. And you mentioned wrestling fans. I noticed that right away because I'm a huge boxing guy. And I used to go to fights all the time. I used to actually cover for uh, for media and press row and stuff. Yeah, I'm like a boxing, old time boxing fanatic as well. I can't wait to talk to you about sports and boxing, man. I can't wait yeah. to pick your brain. About I'm a marvelous, I'm, I love the marvelous Marvin Hagler, uh, hitman Tommy Hearns. Oh. Duran, uh, Aaron Pryor, Alexis Arguello. I mean, that's my that's my baby, man. Uh, Johnny, Hagler's my man. Johnny still has my Hagler Leonard VHS tape. I do, Don't I even get me started on Hagler Leonard. He got robbed. <laughs> got robbed, and he wouldn't refight him. And Hagler, ne- I love Hagler. He never fought again unless Leonard would, would re. And, and Leonard was smart enough to know I'll get killed if I go back in that ring. That's right. Leonard would never fight him again. And I love Leonard, but I'm a Hagler guy, baby. Oh, yeah, Hagler. And he went on to do great things. He moved to Italy, became an actor, you know, went out there and, and had a great living. And a lot of people, they don't do that post-mortem retirement in boxing, especially. I mean, we know the stories. And we have Don nowadays, like, you see a lot of fighters coming back. Mike Tyson just uh, fought Roy Jones. Uh, Holyfield looks great. I don't know how he's going to do in the ring. Uh, an awesome guy. What a gentleman. Met him a couple times. But he looks tremendous, and he's like 57. But it's like, oh. so then you think, like, come on. like even what, a redemp- what a redemption story Mike Tyson is. If you look at all the things that he went through, especially oh. with his daughter passing. and I mean, the guy was probably worth $500 million and lost it all. And, and look at him. And we thought, oh, I love those kind of stories. Oh. That's amazing. And we thought he'd be, you know, found in a hotel room someplace out here. And I figured he'd be dead. Ex- we all thought that. But that, look at the conditioning. I know. And he's positive. Oh, he's, he's, inter- he's entertaining. He's he's going to have his own TV sitcom before long, and we'll all watch it. I mean, it's. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, I don't know. Off subject, sorry. You guys follow the Iron Sheik? By any oh, chance, I, I, on, on Twitter? Twitter, baby. Oh, Iron Sheik on Twitter, Bubba. Are you kidding, so, Bubba? Is he good? Is he a good follow? It, oh, my God. He's the no, best Oh, it's the most entertaining thing on the planet. It's the, I, it's, I, I don't know who does it because it can't right. It can't be Sheiky doing it. Somebody's doing it for him, but it's his side. Just the the, – the, I can't – Tony, you got to describe it to him because I can't. I'm looking, I, at it, I, I'm looking at this right now because I, I want to follow this, man. It's the most random, hilarious thoughts you could ever think of. And plus the the, the deep-rooted hate of Hulk Hogan just comes out uh, every once in a while, which makes Ryan it Brian Blair and uh, – uh, <laughs> and his language. His language is just – out of this world, you'll hear the F word in every sense it can be used <laughs> to describe things he would do to wrestlers that are probably against the law in 94 states. And it's the funniest <laughs> thing you've ever listened to. It's just, I can't even describe it to people. Yeah, I just hit the follow and I'm, I'm going to uh, definitely. Oh. And you will out. not understand half of it, John. You're going to get some of it and you're going to go, what is this? This is dumb. I don't know what this is. And just, just trust us. No, I will. And that's what I love, too. Sometimes when I don't understand something, it's equally as good because it's so random. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, the people that are on social media nowadays that I love to follow. I mean, I'm a big Sopranos fan back oh, in yeah. New Jersey. 
like Steve Sharippa is great. He's a great follow. Uh, you know, very funny. Puts out a lot of funny content. I had the honor of interviewing him recently. Just a great we, guy. We, we had him at TNA. He came on TNA and did a thing with us, Steve Sharippa. He, oh, he did a thing on no, TNA Wrestling. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Uh, I didn't get to get to spend much time with him, but but uh, I'm a big Sopranos junkie. Okay, real quick, the ending. Oh, okay. All right. I think I, I think Tony, he got clipped. Tony got clipped. That's the yes. end. I, thank you, Tony. Tony got clipped in the story. I agree. I, Speaking of Sharippa, is that I, what happened? I was? think it was Paulie too. You think Walnuts? I think Paulie was behind it. Wow, interesting. Go ahead, Tony. Oh, I think the New York Mafia was behind it. I, I, I agree with you. That's. I think Paul, he's always kind of wanted to be with them, from Johnny Sack to all the other guys. He always see. I think that. it's. I, I think it's as simple as his. It, it's just it a liability. Happen. Yeah, it's just going to happen, and and what you know, and that's what I loved was. It, it took me a while because I hated the ending at first, and then you realize that's what the silence is. It's the whole story is about Tony, and Tony's gone. So we're done. And Bobby Bacala, we were just talking about Sharippa. He says, you probably don't hear it when it's coming. They foreshadow that when someone gets clipped in front of Silvio. And so at the end, we also see everything from Tony's point of view for the most part. You know, camera A, camera B. When he comes in, camera A, camera B. And then once he's in, you hear the door open and you see what he's seeing. And then the last thing you see is what he doesn't see. And it was very, I, I thought it was obvious. At first, I like you, Don, I had a hard time. I'm like, is this how they're going to do this? And now that I've, especially during quarantine, watched this show a million more times, I'm like, there's some silent brilliance to this. There's some real captivating writing here, you know? Like, and, you know, the, everyone that's involved in that show, uh, whether I know them on a personal level or whatever, I, I just always felt that there's so much depth to it. Like Pine Barrens, that episode was just- Oh, awesome. best one. Oh, the best one when 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 uh, Imperioli and uh, Paulie are out there and and trying to find the Ukrainian dude or whatever he was. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever got into the wire, but it's it's yeah. it'd be, it'd, 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 unbelievable. Breaking Bad, give me finality, great ending. Too many times they don't know where to stop it, and mm-hmm. you know it's okay to end it. Just yeah, just give us closure. Empire. Yeah. Boardwalk Empire, I thought, went out at the right time. Yeah, good. Well, that was a great show. Oh, wow. Steve Buscemi. And then you also, with vinyl, I thought that was prematurely canceled. I thought they had a lot of potential there, a story. Yeah, I thought. Mafia. See, I thought they tried to do too much. Too much I know, I know. being in the music business, you you, you liked it probably a lot more. But I, I to me, it was kind of like, wow, you're you, – you, I don't know what it was. I could never get into the format of how they were filming it. They did, they did too much mafia stuff. They, they mobbed it up too much. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I love the characters. I love yeah. that. Oh. oh, Bobby Cannavale is a great oh, he's, actor. He's, he's one of my favorite no matter what he's doing. Oh, t- totally, totally. So uh, we're speaking about movies and film. Uh, what have you been doing outside of your show? Because obviously you're doing a lot of radio. And uh, what, do you, what have you been doing to pass the time? Everyone always wants to know. Like, uh, my, my wife will tell you, I'm a, I'm a TV movie junkie. I, I, I try to find the next good show. I can, I'm one of those that I traveled so much and had to talk to so many people for my life. And I talk for a living that I, I probably drive Terry crazy. I'm a homebody man. Now I want to come home. Uh, and, and let me get in the, she'll put me in the master bedroom so she can move around. And, uh, let me uh, let me sit back in back there and put on Ozark or you know the next new show. So if you got a good new show, let me know. But did you, you watch Cobra Kai? Uh, well, I love the original Karate Kid. I don't know that I can do Cobra Kai. I I'm started watching. You- uh, sorry, John. No, go I, ahead, Tony. I started watching that next show on Fox, and it's maybe four or five episodes in. It's super creepy though with the with the AI taking over and stuff like that. I haven't heard, I haven't heard of that. Uh, yeah, no, it's all right. And, and I'm pretty picky, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not into sci-fi very much. Yeah. You know, I'm, I've never been a like star Wars, star Trek guy. That ain't yeah. me. Um, but I like a good, uh, I just watched this great documentary about the pizza bomber from Erie, Pennsylvania in 2003. He, he robbed a bank and, but they, he had a bomber on his neck and then the, 
when the police had him, the bomb blew up, and and it's it's called Evil Genius on Netflix, and it's four oh, episodes. You got to check it out. It's a real documentary, and it's a true story about this mastermind crazy woman. And it it it's I can't explain it. You just got to. I remember the guy. I remember when it happened, where he was telling people this bomb is real, and all of a sudden the bomb blows up, and the oh, guy Christ. dies in the middle of the street. And it's a true story, and it's a it's a story of how. The different branches of of FBI and ATF and the police they they all are doing things separately. If they'd worked together, they'd have solved the whole thing probably in three months. And instead, it took fifteen years. And it's it's really good. Uh, have you seen the Queen's Gambit, the uh, the chess thing? Have you heard about that? No, on what's Netflix, that about? it's pretty good. The girl chess. But I'm I'm you know I I just love a good I like a total escapism. Let me get something going. Yeah, and let I mean, me just... We've been doing a lot of 80s, like, martial arts and 90s martial arts movies. Steven Seagal running back his... Yes. Cast, John claude Van Damme. I'm actually doing a show tomorrow with some of my buddies that, you know, uh, are actually, you know, in the fight game that work for NBC and CBS and stuff like that. The great guys have great podcasts. I'm going to mention them right now. Uh, Brian Campbell, Rafe Bartholomew, and my wife will be joining me for this show and what we're going to do is break down a couple of Steven Seagal movies. Which ones are better than others? <laughs> because I've been watching so many of them. It's weird when you go back. Like, Mark for Death is a great movie. But I'm like, this movie doesn't make any sense at all. Which is the one where him and Tommy Lee Jones are on the ship. Under Siege. That's a great one. Amazing. Yeah. That, that's coming now, up tomorrow. <laughs> now, John, Tony, have you guys ever gotten into the Kung Fu series from the 70s? David Carradine? I did not. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Grunt, I was in, I am Kung Fu junkie, the original Kung Fu and how they filmed it and, and the slow motion with all the ahead fighting. And, but it was so ahead of its time. Yep. And when, you know, finally David Carradine's like, I can't do it anymore. We got to stop. But it was one of those shows that, oh my God, the music and a Western about a, about a Shaolin priest from, you know, that's half American from China. I mean, it was unreal. You know, what? it's out. funny you said that the fight choreography is amazing for its time, especially. Now, we did have a little bit of influence with the Bruce Lee stuff and all that. and but they, well, they he was supposed to originally get the part. Right, exactly. That's why I brought he couldn't up talk. For a TV show, like, the production, like, really? Like, at the time, like, for me, I, I was watching uh, The Best of the Best the other day, one and two. Yeah. Best fight choreography. It's still, to this day, it holds up. In my opinion, there's three movies, Don, that I love with martial arts choreography. Lead the right. Way of Four with Jet Li. Um, Mel Gibson, Danny Glover. Wow. What they yeah. did. Well, you know, Mel Gibson against uh, Busey, Gary Busey in that fight. The first the one. First Lethal Weapon, yeah. Yeah, that was a great one. Very honorable mention. Uh, you know, the, the fight choreographer is like the guy I mentioned, um, well, the movie I mentioned, uh, guy Simon Ree, who was actually played Day Han in Best of the Best One and Two, he does the fight choreography for Cobra Kai. And it's weird how that connects because I was watching Cobra Kai and I'm like, I love the fighting style. Like, I love combat sports. And then I realized, I'm like, this is fucking Simon from the Best of the Best One and Two. This is why I like it because, like, there's a certain style to it. Um, you know, so hey, I mean, that, that's, those are fun shows. Hey, have you ever seen the show? It was on uh, Cinemax, I think. It was called Banshee. Yes. No. Have you heard about Banshee? Some of the greatest fight scenes I've ever seen in my life. This show, I never forget what someone told me about it. It's about a a town where I mean I can't even describe the scenario, and I got so into it. But when I mean they did a fight scene with this girl and this guy. Has like a Kill Bill vibe, right? Yes, it's got a Kill Bill vibe. When the, but these fight scenes, if you love. I mean, it was unbelievable, and they were believable. And I mean, the women were so good at it, and and you bought into the women being just as good as the men. And but if if you've never watched Banshee, start it from start to finish to the end it, and I promise you, and they have a good ending. I promise you, it's one of the greatest shows, and it's it's total male escapism. It's total <laughs> hot women, great fighting. Uh, the, the, the good guy's a bad guy. Uh, you know, the bad guys are good. I mean, it's awesome. 
it's it sounds incredible. Let me tell you something too, and I'll leave you with this because I know it's time to get to dinner and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm good for like 15 minutes if you're cool. Oh, great, nice. let's keep going. Good, because I, I got I a couple questions before we go. So. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I appreciate your time so much, bro. This has been an amazing. Ah, uh, we'll do it again. Oh hell yeah! So with me with combat sports, I think the women are better than men with mixed martial arts. Now they become bigger stars. It seems like if they're good. Right. So I think that they become better because I think their agility is more cut for the rolling around, the wrestling. Um, they have more, you know, just agility overall. Yeah. Like women can be very explosive. And, you know, it's like they, they got the striking down way better. If you watch women's boxing, and, and I'm a huge boxing guy. Boxing's my passion. But if you watch women's boxing, these girls, they have their strikes down, but they don't have power. They don't have, like, much passion. It's very boring. Like, I'm sorry to knock on women's boxing right now. But when I watch, you know, MMA with the, with the ladies, uh, I see a lot of agility. I see a lot of fire. I see a lot of passion. And I think that their bodies are way – it's more like they're gymnasts. Like they're yeah. I was going to say, the best women's boxing match I ever saw was Million Dollar Baby. And uh, – <laughs> uh, uh, that match where she goes gets paralyzed. That was right. hey, listen though, being in the wrestling business, I've seen some female wrestlers. Gail Kim, Mickey James, Awesome Kong, uh, uh, the beautiful people. I've seen I've seen some girls do some things in the ring that and I and, and, and if any of them, if they see this and I leave your name out, please forgive me because it's just a time. But uh we 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 were able to headline. We headlined a pay per view with Awesome Kong and Gail Kim, uh, having them. And now you got this big two hundred pound woman, you know, two fifty or whatever, and and she's the nicest woman in little Kia. But you know, she comes out to this music, you know, bum bum, you know, Awesome Kong, and then Gail Kim, who's who's Asian and 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 does kind of the martial art thing. And I mean, not only did they make it believable, it headlined. And when they you beat see each them, other up, though, oh, when you see them do what they can do, sometimes, uh, man, it's uh, you oh, know when they get, when they get rid of the fluff and they actually got into the work. Oh my God, I I I, I was in awe. I, I was in awe when I saw Lacey Evans for the first time, and I was really in awe of like the way she can maneuver herself, like like a gymnast. But you also spoke about AJ Styles before, who I've watched and seen. His athleticism is unbelievable. He's in his forties. I, I yeah, hope I'm not. Joe nobody is, getting mad at me, but he's in his forties. Samoa Joe. I was there live watching him, and I'm like, you know, he's he's a heavy set guy. And uh, John, I remember, years. I remember when Samoa Joe's would be in the ring, and the entire crowd starts chanting, "Joe's gonna kill you, Joe's." gonna kill you that guy was so over and so good you didn't look at his body you watched him do things he would do these kicks upside down he would leap over the ropes through the ropes he had a ch choke slam that was the greatest thing i ever saw um if you ever want to see a match john i don't know tony may have seen it but if you ever do youtube Three way 19 uh, or 2005 Unbreakable. All right, 2005 Unbreakable three way match AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe's undefeated, he hasn't lost to anybody. Uh, Christopher Daniels is the champion, AJ Styles is AJ Styles, king of the X Division. The three of these guys do an X Division title match. It was our main event to this day. I think it's the best match Mike Tanay and I ever called together. One of the best. I mean, we told a story, but it had nothing to do with us. They gave us the story. These, these three guys, for 20 minutes, put on an exhibition in the ring. I don't care if you like wrestling or not. When you're done watching the, the – the, make sure it's unbreakable. Two thousand, yep. uh, The first one. They did two, but the first one. AJ Christopher Daniels, who's with AEW still. Christopher Daniels is. Yep. Uh, AJ's still going, and Samoa Joe due to injuries. I think he's doing more announcing now. But uh, the three of them in their prime put on a match that Dave Meltzer called it one of the greatest matches, uh, five-star, best he's ever seen type thing. Was That was a smaller ring too, right? It, well, I think we have a six-sided ring at that right. point. Yeah, we, like may have, the, we may have had the, the six side ring. ring. Yes, and I'm telling you, Tony, what they do, those three, the story, uh, it's unreal. 
and you're exhausted when you're done and you're like, how do these guys do this? And those, that, it, it's just there. You would think the whole thing was, I don't know how they, uh, you know, how it's choreographed is beyond me because that, I, that that's pros, man. And not only that, but they, they hurt each other, man. Oh, they kick and hit and punch. And, <laughs> and if you don't hit them, I, I, I remember Kurt Angle one time, true story. Uh, I, I won't mention the other guy cause I love him to death, but the guy wasn't hitting him hard enough. They were doing a, they were going to, he was, they were trying to build this other guy and he goes out there and he doesn't hit Kurt hard enough. And, and Kurt Angle's freaking Kurt Angle, man. The yeah. Olympic gold medal, maybe the greatest, maybe the greatest I've ever seen. He's the I never got ever. to watch. He's, he's a bull. I never got to watch. Uh, I never got to watch uh, Shawn Michaels live, but Kurt Angle, AJ Styles did a couple matches. Kurt Angle, Joe did a couple matches that, you know, I can't even describe to you. Kurt may be the greatest I've ever seen, but I'll never forget. He's out there with this guy. It's a big guy. And he's trying to put him over. It's what they call it in the business. He's right. trying to build, help this guy become big. Like Ric Flair did the sting, make him a star. And this guy's, you know, punching him and, and buddy, Kurt changes the script right in the middle <laughs> And, you know, sorry, yeah, I ain't putting you over tonight. And, you know, basically changes the whole script. And Just beat him up, right? Beats him up. So in the so I'm doing the show with Mike today, and in the background, I hear noises going on in the back as we're, we're still, we got still more broadcasting. We're doing a live television show every week. So I hear it in the back, and I'm like, what's going on? And Mike looks at me and says, school is in session, and Professor Angle is teaching a lesson. <laughs> now I find out later what's happening where Kurt goes back and says, you ever hit me with that pussy ass shit again? Uh, I'll, I'll destroy you in the ring. If you're going to be a star, you hit me. You don't just fake. You hit me. You make it because I'm Kurt Angle and I'm not going down. If you hit me, you know, like a wuss, you wow. better throw that punch and it better feel like it. And I mean, it was a lesson. I yeah. mean, Kurt was That's telling crazy. him. You want me to put you over? You earn it, brother. And they, and you better I make heard, the world think that you can beat me up because you know I heard you a can't story in that, real life. I heard a story that he actually wrestled Brock Lesnar, like with beat amateur him. rules, and beat him. Beat him in the back, dude. He won an Olympic gold medal with a broken freaking neck yeah. against the Iranian, and that's no joke. And he gave that's up. Insane. He was giving up sixty pounds, and he beat him like one nothing or something. Like he got out of a thing, but. They wrestled like a match in the back, and he beat Brock Lesnar. Wow. Well, I got another story for you. I, did, I don't think he beat him, but him and A.J. Styles did it too because A.J. was a big-time high school – or uh, I, I don't know about college because I don't think – but uh, A.J. gave Kurt everything he wanted. That's how wow. good A.J. is. But, yeah, <laughs> I heard the same that. Yeah. yeah, same thing with Brock. I heard that uh, – Kurt's on another. Kurt was on yeah. another level. People don't understand that. Kurt was a, you know, Kurt was the. I, all right, all right, real quick. I got a Kurt Angle story. All right. So, so to, to, Tony John, I get this script right. We have our script meeting for the show, and we all get there in the morning. And there's only a certain people. You got production and the script writers, and you know the bookers and everybody that puts the show together. No wrestlers. And I look on the script, and Kurt Angle comes to the table, grabs Don West throws him on the floor and puts him in an ankle lock and Don West leaves injured. Okay. And I'm reading this, right. For those that, and I'm going, Holy crap. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And they're like, okay, Don, you're going to have your big moment, man. Kurt Angle's going to come over. And so Kurt's a, one of the coolest. I've still got him in my, one of the coolest guys, good friends, still got him on my phone. And so I, Kurt and Sting are sharing a locker room and I, knock on the door and I'm like, Hey, Kurt, can I talk to you? And Kurt's like, what do you want done? I said, uh, you've, you've seen the script. You're going to come over. Can, can we kind of go over this? Cause I don't want to blow it. I don't want to do, you know, Kurt looks at me and says, d -Dub, if we practice this, you ain't going to do it. So no. <laughs> and leaves it there. Sting's like, yeah, dude, just uh, know what's coming. And, you know, and they, Basically, see ya, and now I'm scared to death. All right, I don't know what how it's going to go down. I see these guys do this. He's going to twist my ankle in half. Right before the show starts, I'm in the back. Kurt calls me over and says, "I right, hey, beat up. I say, yeah. He says, 
All right, I ain't going to hurt you at all. I'm going to come over and I'm going to pick you up and put you on the ground like a feather. But I'm going to tell you this. And Steve's standing right there. And he says, if you don't act like I'm tearing your leg off for real, I will tear your leg off for real. <laughs> so if you don't sell this, like it's the second coming, we're, you will, you'll, you'll be seeing the Lord real quick. So we do this thing during the, during the thing. And, and the whole storyline was him and Samoa Joe were in this big battle. And he's pro he said no rematch. So I'm talking to Mike today and I say, well, you heard Kurt. There's not going to be a rematch. And of course, Kurt walks by and goes, what'd you say? And I'm like, Kurt, I'm just repeating you. You said no rematch. And he just stares at me and said, I'm freaking out. So finally he grabs me and I mean, he just. He's Kurt Angle, and he hauls me up off this table. I mean, you can YouTube it. You can say Kurt Angle, Don West. I think you can find it. And he grabs me and throws me on the ground. And again, like a feather, he looks like he's slamming me down there. And then he grabs my leg, and he's doing the ankle lock. Nothing. I don't feel nothing. Now, I know he's doing it, so I am pounding the pavement. I'm <laughs> screaming. Uh, Mike, today's calling for help. I'm just going bananas. I mean, they think I'm dying. I <laughs> mean, guys, I didn't, it doesn't even feel like my leg's being twisted. That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how good they are. So the people come over to get me right, and they come over to help, and Kurt walks away. Next thing I know, I feel this shot of pain on my back, like, like a bullet hit me. I mean, a shot of pain. Something hit me. And I'm like, what the hell? And I look up at the guys, like, what you guys do? And they said, Don, that was Kurt. He, when he was twisting your ankle, he grabbed your shoe off, and he just threw the shoe at you, and it <laughs> hit me. I mean, the heel hits me dead. I mean, there's a two-inch imprint of this heel in my back. And Kurt was just... In the moment, so he that was the only time it hurt, and I mean, it hurt. He fired a shoe at you, <laughs> he fires my own shoe at me. I'm wearing dress shoes, so I get to the so they take me to the back. Kurt, first thing Kurt does when he comes to the back, and I'm waiting back there, he comes to the back, dude. I, D -Dub, I'm so sorry, man. I, I was just in the moment, and I had the shoe in my hand, and I didn't think I'd hit you. And I'm like, dude, it's all good. Now, the funny part was th to be in character. My, my ankle's been, my leg's been tore up. I have to wear crutches for like the next six episodes. <laughs> my wife at home in Nashville, she they see it all happening. She tells the story. Oh, no, the crutches weren't supposed to be the real deal. That's legit. So I literally have to wear the crutches when I go into Terry's bar to have drinks. I got to have the crutches with me. And yeah, people think, you know, that I'm literally, I, and, and they're like, if you're going to be in character, you got to play this role. And I did it, man. I wore them crutches. Now, the great thing I discovered about that was I got to board every plane first, <laughs> sit where I wanted, you know. And I'll never forget the wrestlers going, oh, dude, because I'd get on before them and their first time. <laughs> I'd get on, better seats, got the leg room. And I'll never forget it. They're going, oh, he's in a crutch angle. Son of a bitch. He's going to be able to get the best seat to play in every play. I didn't want to give up the crutches because I'm, I'm flying. Like my other leg. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it's a true story, man. Love freaking Kurt freaking angle, man. That's you, awesome. You were, you were talking about preparation. I mean, for like commentating, you know, you're just as swift with commentating for the wrestling and TNA and talking in general. Like, do you prepare much, or you just kind of just go with the flow? Now, you know what's funny? Mike Tanay was the most prepared person because he his job as a as the play by play is to set the stage, mm -hmm. and this guy's my best friend, and he he meticulous notes everything. Just you know, he has to set every entrance. He's got to tell the story as they're coming down. I mean, with me, I would try to do that, and he'd be like, "What are you doing?" And I'd be like, well, I want to make sure I'm prepared. He's like, dude, make make small note. You are your color. You react. <laughs> we don't know what we're going to see. They may not do it the way it's supposed to be done. So you can't react according to your notes if they don't, if they miss the kick. If he misses a kick by a foot, you better not say he hit him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and and he was like, you just be you. And do your thing and react. And it was the best advice. You know, I mean, I take notes and you've got things you got to know. But as far as, you know, you just watch the action and do what a, a normal person would do when they do whatever it is they do. 
when you turned when you turned on him, that was one of the best TV moments ever. You know, Mike wrote most of. (laughs) And and while I when I'm going off on Mike, what you can't see is Mike's making faces at me and doing these expressions, (laughs) and he wants he's like, if you bust character. You're screwed. Right. I didn't bust character. And he's trying and he, hard. He's trying hard. And he helped me write. And I, to this day, people are like, are you and Mike still friends? Do you guys talk? And I'm like, all right, people, seriously, get that. <laughs> get the hook out of your right. mouth, man. That's like all these guys. I watch these stories and they're like, we used to try to make the Undertaker laugh in the ring. <laughs> like all the wrestlers used to try to make him break character. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he did. He tried to get me to break character and I wouldn't do it. And, but we wrote this thing and put it as one of our best things. And, and I loved that character when I became heel Don West and I was the oh, heel. Was great. I loved it because. It's like Mike told me, he said, you don't understand. You're going to be given the freedom that every wrestling announcer wants. You can say anything you want. Now, one of the cool things was I got into Mick Foley's book, his book, um, Countdown to Lockdown. He wrote it about his match with Sting. And it's the first time him and Sting ever wrestled. It was going to be in a steel cage. As we're leading up to this, there was a point where Mick was kind of in control and he was going to make all these champions had to wrestle ex champions. So Jeff Jarrett's got to wrestle Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe's got to wrestle AJ and, and you know, whatever Scott Steiner's got to wrestle. And who does Mick Foley wrestle a cardboard cutout of Rocky Balboa, you know, a cardboard cutout with a guy holding it behind him. And I'll never forget when, when this was happening, uh, Mike today looks at me and he says, dude, you got to call this whole match. And I'm like, what? He's like, you got to call it like a heel would call it, like it's real. And he said, because I can't call it. I'm, 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 my credibility be shot because I know it's a fire. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, the guy's got a cardboard cut out the ring, but you got to call it like, and I'll never forget that. And I did. And and we, we actually did it in post so we could stop and start and redo and I could get it right. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget getting a call from Mick Foley going, dude, I thought I'd gone too far when we did this originally. And he said, when I finally got home after it aired, my son, I said to my son, I said, how stupid was the Rocky Balboa cardboard cutout? He said, dude, Don, believe it or not, Don West took that whole thing and turned it into this hilarious, wonderful. And he watched and he put it in his book. And he said, That's awesome. I got it. I got to give Don West the credit. He, he, he turned that into something fun. If anyone yeah. can sell it, Don, it's you. Well, you know thank I mean? you. But- You're a natural. That's why I asked you because I, I do things with my show in a, in a very natural format. I have bullet points. I have places I want to go. But when I have great people like yourself on and my buddy Tony, uh, again, a lifelong friend of mine, one of, uh, probably at the top of my best friend list ever. You know, I've known this guy since childhood when I was terrible on his baseball team, and he was always way better than I was. And he remembers that because I was a shitbag baseball player. Okay? Let's face facts here. Don't let you were leaps and bounds beyond how good I was. But when people have a natural ability, you know, to sell, selling, selling, you can't really teach selling. You can show them certain things, but you got to have charisma. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Internship. Great, great movie. Uh, Vince Vaughn. It's in that movie. It's about sales. It's about people that don't have many, you know, skills, but they try to get like a job at Google and they're so good at selling. They, they find a way to get in. And, and that's what, you know, for me, um, a lot of what sales is, but you want to, of course, always be honest and all that good stuff. Um, but just an absolute natural. And let me ask you this about wrestling before I, I know Tony's got some extra questions he wants to throw out there to you. Uh, did you have to train to like, get beat up like that or did you nah. just deal with it no training nah, i got beat up by two people scott steiner and kurt angle and uh uh that was it as far as that no no i would are you kidding me at that point if i had trained i'd have probably had a heart attack um, <laughs> uh, no but but i'll tell you what you respect what they do you and that's why you can use any word you want to use with a wrestler but if you use the word fake mm. Buddy, they'll take a chair and smash you over the head and say, how fake was that? Yeah. Because, you know, you do a double flip off the top rope and, and the guy moves out of the way and you slam on that hard mat. You want to know how fake that is? You can say choreographed. You can say predetermined. You can say anything. You, you use the word fake and you'll have, a, you'll have a fake black eye. I can promise you that. 
man. Oh, it won't be dudes, fake. Man. They're tough dudes. Yeah. But it was uh, – that was fun. That was unique. It was different. Glad I experienced it and uh, met some neat people. And, and sure. uh, you know, some people you wouldn't want to ever be in a room with again. Oh, of course. But that, other that, people that you, you – you, you know, it's funny. I've always said it. The heels, the bad guys are generally the nicest people. The guys that play the bad guys are generally the coolest people in the, in the whole thing. So, <laughs> But uh, it's, it's, it, was, it was unique and fun. But I uh, appreciate it. When I saw someone get slammed through the table, like front row, literally. Ain't nothing I, fake about that, bro. There ain't nothing fake about that, brother. I had uh, great tickets, luckily, uh, you know, from one of my friends. He, he was running the show for the Golden Knights out here, and he knew I was into wrestling, so he hooked me up. It was the second SmackDown that they had on Fox. And I'm sitting there, and I, I'm like, this is out of control. And they're actually bumping into, like, right where you're at. And there's times where, like, I don't know, these, these wrestlers are going to land on my lap. This is insane. This is awesome. I hope they do. It's fun. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think it was an AJ Styles match, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, jumping off the top of the ropes and smashing it. To, I'm like, oh, my. Like, what is this? You never see anything like this. And I was talking about fans before. Like, in a lot of sporting events, like, if, if you went to, like, a Yankees-Red Sox game, good luck with fans being nice. Whenever I went to like any kind of wrestling, everyone is really, really cool. It's like a, it's like a brotherhood. And yeah, it's it's it's, it's it's a it's a unique fan base, right. and and <laughs> it's a loyal fan base. And I've learned to appreciate it more as I've been out of wrestling because the longer I'm out, the more popular I become. So, you know, that's a neat thing. You know, they they don't like you when you're doing it, but when you're done, they all love you. And but but I tell you, it's the neatest, nicest group. My wife got to experience it at a couple of these StarCast events that we worked at. And, they look cool. And, yeah, and she even said, she says, I can't believe how nice these people are. And everybody is just so respectful. And it it's, it's hard to explain to somebody that doesn't get it. It's hard to explain. I noticed it immediately. Me, me and Tony used to go to Yankee games all the time. And we were probably the two biggest shit talkers. <laughs> you know, out of a capacity of fifty-eight thousand people, Tony, we were terrible. We were bad. Yeah. It, it was more towards the players than the fans, though. It was towards the players. We were bad towards fans. But man, if you got us next to a player we didn't like, Tony, remember what we did to Carlos Lee? Oh, he can't read. We, we destroyed him. <laughs> it was terrible. The White Sox Yankee, got it bad. You Yankee fans <laughs> suck. You know that. <laughs> we threw batteries at Jose Canseco. Remember that? Oh, Dude, I, I tell you what, I made a promise to God Almighty when the Cubs finally won after 108 years. Uh, I, it, it's, it's, I've been so intense and screaming and f bombing and everything in my entire. Once they, I'm like, Lord, you let me have this one, and I, and I've now become the most mellow baseball fan ever. Oh, but great. 108 great, years yeah. we how, waited. How you ironic. guys, your 27, 28 championships, whatever it is, can. Kiss my ass, but we got <laughs> we got it, and then what a what a game seven and uh, that was awesome. And oh we, yeah, oh, baby for it. you. Yeah. Try we, living it. We rented you guys Chapman that year, and then we got Torres for it. Yeah, and, and you know what? We won that in spite of Joe Madden. He yeah. tried to blow that force. And he sure did. The, the night before with Chapman, should have never even brought him in. And then the last game, he should have never taken Hendricks out. The guy was freaking unhittable. And he did. Uh, but I'll tell you what, sense. man. It didn't make any sense at all. Yeah, oh, what a moment. He's nowadays. And Tony, you know about it. Like, uh, you know, sometimes I, he's gotten a little bit better, our coach with the Yanks. But at the same time, it's like, he, it's very questionable. He's, when he's you the same as Girardi, please. He's yeah. I mind see. Crap and, yeah. You guys, you, you need a manager. That's it. You don't need an ex baseball player. Joe you Torrey need was a, good, man. Joe Torrey. You need a had, manager. He had the feel. He he knew. Joe Torrey was winning with Paul O'Neill and and Bernie Williams yeah. and that oh, group. What a, team. Yeah. what a team. What a lineup. You know, yeah. 96, 98, 99, 2000. I mean, come on. You had Chuck Knobloch that couldn't, you know, throw to first base anymore, you know, which was crazy. But we had the great Tino Martinez, you know. Derek Tino Sander. Martinez, another great role player. The people don't know how good he was as yeah. a role player. Oh, Bernie Williams is one of those unsung Bernie. heroes. Uh, 
uh, Jorge Posada. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you he, know, he should have got more Hall of Fame consideration. But he who was your backup catcher that was hitting all the freaking right. home runs? Oh, the, the backup catcher was hitting home runs. Tony, take that. You know who that was? Uh, I know Posada threw him out there. No, uh, no. I'm trying to think of a guy's name. Backup infielder, mate. Uh, uh, we had Chuck. Uh, well, well, uh, he ended up getting, having Broches. some Broches. trouble with Scott, 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 yeah, Scott Broch is at third. Yes, base. Scott Broch. Who yeah. was third base? Scott Broch. Tremendous Broches. clutch hitter. Scott Broch. Yeah. Tremendous oh, yeah. clutch hitter. Soho and, would come in and get a hit whenever you needed it. And all yeah. Things. I'm going to let yeah. Tony take this because I jinxed the World Series, and to this day, I still feel oh. like shit about it. Tony, look at his face. You won't get any sympathy from me. No, Andy, no, no sympathy. No, you I Cub, fuck this up. When you've been a Cub fan your whole life, you you I got no tolerance for people that want to bitch about their team. Yeah. 2003, <laughs> done, done. 2003, we're sitting in John's house watching the Arizona Yankee game. Yankees go up, bottom of the ninth coming up. Mariano got the two outs in the eighth, one, two, easy, nice. John pops the champagne before the bottom of the ninth. I said, what the, what the, what the fuck are you doing? You're talking 2001? 2001, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. Oh, uh, what was uh, Luis Gonzalez was at the play? Well, that was at the end, yeah. yeah. The, oh. the whole inning just went wrong. He pops the champagne before the inning starts. And I said, what are you doing? We, we, we didn't win yet. And all downhill from there. I, I didn't talk I'm to him whole, for like a week. Well, I'm well, you brought up 2003. Know. You brought up 2003, Tony, and, I, and, and oh. I'm going to have to go on this. That I'll never forget that one. We're up three to nothing in the eighth inning. Game six, we're going to the World Series. We're going to play you guys. Yep. We're going to play the Yankees in 2003. And – the Bartman incident. Now, it wasn't Bartman's fault. He didn't do no. nothing. He was a fan trying to grab a ball. People forget uh, Gonzalez dropped the routine double play ball two plays yeah. later that would have ended the inning and we'd have been ahead three to one. And then, of course, you knew game that seven was guy. fucked. And uh, uh, that was a tough. That's why in 2000 or uh, 16, when the dude hits the home run to tie the game in the eighth inning, I knew it was over. We're done. Over. How we came back and won that. Oh. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna drunkest go I've here. ever been. Oh, yeah, that was we're going to let you go here, Don, in a moment. Uh, Tony, you have any final thoughts? Anything you want to share? No, it's been a real pleasure, man. It's, it's a, It was Absolutely. a lot of fun sitting down and talking, and after having seen you for so long, it was great. Well, let's do it again sometime, and and I mean it, and, and you know we, whatever topic, man. We obviously no, we co- we all can hit a million topics. Yeah, no. I mean, no we we've already hit we've hit Toto, <laughs> Marvin Hagler, uh, AJ Styles, and uh, you know Nolan Ryan. I think we're pretty good. Is that your favorite card? Oh no 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 no. Uh, I, I I had a huge collection. I had hundreds of thousands of cards, and I kept twenty. And I have uh, not many favorites, so I'm curious. Uh, the, the Nolan Ryan should have been. And let me tell you a quick story on the Nolan Ryan card. So my dad takes me to a game. Jerry Kuzman is pitching against the Cubs. Jerry Kuzman beats him one to nothing, two to one, something like that. Complete game. Jerry Kuzman, screw that. Guy. So I get Miracle, home. Miracle Mets here. And, uh, might have been. Might have been. So I get home and I grab every single card that has Jerry Kuzman on it. And I take oh, a no. green, I take a green pen, and I'm, 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 I'm doing green teeth on these guys and green mustaches, and I'm defacing every Jerry Kuzman card. Well, one of the cards I defaced about a dozen of them was the '68 Jerry Kuzman rookie card, and Tony can tell you who's on it with him. Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan rookie card. And later in life, I'm on Shop at Home, and I'm selling that card for 5000 a pop or more. And yeah. I, you can sell them as quick as you can get them. All I can think of is all the Nolan Ryan cards I've got with Jerry Kuzman with green teeth and oh. boogers. I'm putting boogers in his nose, <laughs> as, as a six-year-old kid does. I'm putting boogers in his nose with a green pen. That's where the green pen came in. I'm putting boogers on Jerry Kuzman. That's awesome. I probably I probably defaced $150,000 worth of Nolan Ryan God. rookie cards. Oh, <laughs> So, so do, do you actually collect or no? I used to. I wow. used to. I've done a Me lot too. of. Uh, I did. You know, we had it. We, my wife and I downsized, so yeah. we got rid of a lot of stuff and found our little dream cabin on the river in the mountains. And and yeah. um, you know, got to make. I was, this- 
Yeah, I was a weird collector, so I used to just like opening stuff, right? It was great. It was a yeah. real opening, and then I just had to get rid of everything. But I kept. I have like a. I have a nineteen oh nine Cy Young. It's destroyed. I mean, it's yeah. If I got yeah, I graded. sold it. I sold a nineteen oh nine Honus Wagner T two oh six. Oh and yeah. it, it it was chewed up, spit out, and we still got like eighty grand for it. I mean, no, it was ridiculous. Crazy. Yeah, no, my, no, no, no. It's I kid you not. Probably eighty grand for it. Yeah, that's that, awesome. I, I believe it. I was doing some research on this recently, and it's actually sold like you know at mint condition for over three million dollars. Three million, oh, yeah. That, yeah. It's actually not even mint. It's a PSA eight. It's an eight. And it's it was an eight. From yeah. 19- You'll never find a mint no. one. It'd be a fake no, 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 if it no, was. Mint. But yeah, I bought this Cy Young card for two fifty when I was like fifteen. Yeah, and it good was call. battered, and I'm good like, card. wow, this thing's cool, man. So yeah. I kept that. No, that, that and you know what's funny, John? That that uh, Wagner was owned by Wayne Gretzky, and that, hmm. yeah, the one that sold for three million that, that was originally owned by Wayne Gretzky and John Candy and wow. uh, McNulty, the the guy that owned the Kings, and the three of them owned it together, and they gave it to Tops for like four hundred and fifty thousand, and then of course the the card's gone to. I I've held that card in my hand. Thing. Get out. Someone that That's invested cool. in that, they did it at the right time, and they made a lot of money out of that. Yeah. I, I held that card in my hand. That that and, very card that sold for three million. And that's well, the one that's the PSA eight. That's PSA huge. eight. That's amazing. That's that's the card, man. That's the card, baby. That the nineteen oh nine. Fifty two tops mantle. Fifty two tops condition. mantle. That's the two <laughs> holy grails right there, baby. Yeah. What about Babe Ruth? What about Babe Ruth? How, how eh, there's a few of them. There's some rare ones, but but uh, nothing nothing like those two. Those are the yeah, cards. So and the 52 ones. mantle, because 90% of them were destroyed and thrown in the river. Bicycle and, spokes. And- <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the, the, the Honus Wagner, because he wouldn't let him put them in the cigarette packs. And... and uh, it's just I don't yeah, know. He, he wasn't. Ex- he wasn't on any of the Piedmonts or the uh, the other yeah. One, right. Yeah, That's crazy. So last Amazing. last question. If, if you right. have one, one second, I know Will Ferrell did you before, right? He did right. on Saturday Night Live uh, three different times. Yes, awesome stuff. Thank you. Did you ever hear the Opie and Anthony stuff? And what'd you think of it? Oh, I've been on Opie and Anthony's show a dozen times. Oh, have you been on? Yes. I, I miss that. I mean, Anthony does a good done. When list. he did the thing with the cards and putting them in the girls and oh, Britney you know, Spears, explain Holy to people crap. what that's about. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I, I've been on their show a, a dozen times, probably. I don't know, or have done things with them a dozen. Oh, times. Okay, so I mean, I thought it was the most funny thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Like Anthony's, he's a funny dude. So. <laughs> They yeah, helped me out too when I good. when I started with TNA and we were doing something different. They they really did stepped up and helped me out, and I was able to use them to help build my character. and And uh, they were great to me. Opie and oh, Anthony that, were, were really good to me. They oh, were that's uh, awesome. Yeah, they were real fans, and I appreciate them. Now, for real, because I remember when when you left Shop at Home, I was devastated. I'm like, what the hell am I going to watch at two in the morning? And and they had it on their show like the next day. They're like, Don West isn't with Shop at Home anymore. I'm like. Wow, these guys know too. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was getting a raise, and I got fired. I'll never forget it. But uh, uh, so we had a new ownership, and he didn't want to be known as the company that had the screaming baseball card guy. Wow. And I'll never forget that. Walked in to, to to meet him, and he said, "Oh, this this meeting's not going to go the way you think." I can see that already. I thought I'm getting ready to get the 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 ring, baby. I'm getting ready. Yeah. To, they're going to give me a half a million a year, and let's rock and roll. And uh, nope, nope, I was getting the the pink card man the pink slip but it all worked out because i was burned out and you know what you just gotta i'll never forget it and i I mean people don't know that i did that live from midnight to eight in the morning with maybe an hour break and i did it for 11 years and my health was shot and uh the best and then i ended up getting like you know a year's severance and and my wife and i traveled the world man so that's awesome. It, it all worked out. And then I got back in the and then I got in the wrestling business and and sports talk radio in Nashville and and uh, I'm not I ain't complaining about anything, man. I'm no, that absolutely. Dude. Like I said before, you're a natural at it. You know the energy. Like even if you don't feel well, I know about this. Sometimes you have good and bad days, but when you gotta go, you gotta go. You know that you gotta do your thing. And when you get passionate about something and you're lucky enough to do something that you love, like. 
be talking about sports and selling because Don, we know selling is a natural high. Tony, you know about this too. It's when you're making money and you're you're doing things and you're being passionate to your commitments, that's a that's a high. That's an endorphin that goes off in your brain, you know. And then if you're doing it in an articulate fashion, and plus Don, like I know this as being, you know, you're also a you know a radio host and I do my podcast and all that kind of stuff, is that doing radio shows and, and having a natural high of doing that and making people happy. I mean, there's always going to be haters, right? Yeah. I don't pay attention to that. I, I love the people that always chime in and say nice things and to connect and have guests like yourself, which Don, you were absolutely amazing. Well, I appreciate y'all. You guys are fun. So fun. I'm glad I did it. And it's funny about the selling thing. Like even my radio show now, it's, it's all based on selling sponsorships. And, and, uh, you know, that's how you make money. Yes. But I'm hoping, but I've done it for so long. I'm hoping one day I can just have that job where you don't have to sell anything. Sell, sell, sell. You know what I mean? I am so tired of being, okay, all right, I got to go grab another sponsor here and try to figure out, you know, and, and, but the good news is, is I'm lucky. My sponsors are all. Are, are, are friends and and got become friends and and they sponsor the show and the show is doing well so it, and Great. it does them well but uh one day guys i hope i don't ever have i mean i have sold <laughs> my entire life that's all that's i've been done. The world done and i'm just want to talk about andy pettit and and you know uh why why is dick allen not in the hall of fame and you know that kind of stuff i'm doing the same shit with sponsorship i mean right now my sponsors are cbd and dick pills yeah we all we all need that kind of stuff hey you know what they spend the money brother i did a dick pill uh infomercial uh back in the day get out of here no i I kid you not i did a dick pill infomercial Oh, if I could get what my hands on that. I don't know if you can find it. I don't know uh, <laughs> if it aired much, but I, 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 I got in the infomercial business till the guy that that was doing it with us ro- ro- basically robbed us. It was a bad yeah. one of those bad life experiences that you have to learn. But no, I did, uh, I did infomercials, and I did, I did them with like uh, Billy Mays and shit like that, and did some things. But I did a Dick Pill infomercial, man. <laughs> well, you know, I'm taking right now <laughs> to my sponsors. You know, uh, potential sponsors. I want to get this. There's a brand at the gas station. I call it Love at a Gas Station. It's called T Bone. But this thing, guys, you got to clear your calendar. You you you, you gotta you gotta have to take a couple days off. I'm gonna do a Don West. You're gonna need some time off for a couple of days. But I'm telling you, you're gonna send her to outer space with this thing because Don. Let me tell you, man, this thing is like there's no no side effects. <laughs> You know, like it I would kill me. It. Yeah, it's called pregnancy. There's a side effect, brother. Uh, as long Don. as your dick, as long as your dick doesn't look like some of those vegetables that guy does on the commercial, you know, uh, that, that's all. Uh, uh, hey guys, thank you. That man. was fun, man. That was awesome. <laughs> thank you, Don. Thanks a lot. I can't wait. Thank to you, guys. You. Peace, love. Let's do it again and uh, good times. Absolutely. Appreciate your time, man. You Tony, so John, time. nice to meet you guys, man. You too, bud. What a great time this was. Thank you. Good stuff. Bye-bye, man. Bye, guys.